Hello again, art students, fantastically well. Greetings today from Tewo, Tewotacan, um, outside of Mexico City by an hour. This is a fantastic archaeological site that deals with and it actually translates over as place where God's becoming. A fantastic spot to go and actually understand the roots of different aspects of Native American cultural heritage, which was what we'll be talking about today. Why study Native American cultural heritage? Well, let's look at a couple of things. First off, we have an entire muralism movement that's actually developed around the idea of Native American cultural heritage. We have the idea of the zombie, Night of the Living Dead, coming out of this cultural heritage. The idea of our calendar, co-education, the idea of all sorts of different fiestas, dance music, salsa, rumba, um, bachata. Uh, we have the lovely Day of the Dead ceremony, which many of us saw in Coco. We have all sorts of agricultural products, including corn and tomato and potato and peppers um, and chocolate, uh, tobacco, some um, barbecue. These are all kind of Native American. So these are some of the reasons why we should actually have a, an idea on the culture. They are the original inhabitants, of course, of the United States of America and also all of the Americas, North and South Americas. And here they are, if you don't know on the map, but if you look at the scale, it ranges in a very lengthwise area, the entire range of Europe all the way down to South Africa. So this entire exchange, the vast majority of the height of the, the world or the length of the world, however you want to phrase it, from tip to tip, which means we go from one climactic changes all the way down to warmer, warmer, warmer. We hit the equator and then all the way back down towards the Arctic again. So we have one of the greatest variations in range um, that actually happens with just a little bit of transportation that shows up here across the Panama Canal to get through or across this little isthmus or spit of land. It's a pretty remarkable thing. We used to think that the Native Americans were in at least north um, of kind of Mexico were one group. And this was really probably based upon no factual information, but much more along the ideas, all right, this is the land we inhabited. So on some of our answers have to be slightly different versus the people that were farther south that were Spanish, um, particularly because they spoke different languages, right? The colonial languages for our particular Native Americans ended up being French and English, mostly English. South was Spanish because of the Spanish colonization. So there must be differences. We now have absolutely completely um, disregarded that. And think of this as kind of one super culture where we can go back and look 10,000 years ago at the land bridge across um, Siberia up here. We think that out of Asia, most Native Americans came here and then populated throughout the entire North and South America, depending upon different cultural groups, forming things such as the Eastern Woodlands area, this orangish area over here on the United States and note Canada map, they overlap and developed the three sisters of Native American agriculture. Here we have corn, beans, and squash. So the entire idea of the three, what are called the three sisters, that really are how Native Americans are able to survive in this new economy. Um, one of the most important aspects of this entire group for us is the impact it has even on our way of life and our form of government. So this is a video based upon um, the idea of the Haudenosaunee um, Confederacy, better known as the Iroquois Confederacy, but unfortunately that's a name their enemy gave them, so we don't use that very often anymore. The story recorded in this bell tells of a warrior named Hiawatha who meets a prophet. One of the great early Americans now we talk about today. The story goes that he came up with a way of helping a person who was in grief 
by using this wampum to clear their eyes, open their ears, clear their throat so they could speak clearly. Using the purity of shells to bring a person to a clear state of mind is called the condolence ceremony. It was invented by Hiawatha and the Haudenosaunee still practice it today. And that's the area of Niagara Falls today. He was a sorcerer. He had supernatural powers. He could communicate with the birds and rattlesnakes and wolves and the animal world, and they would help him. He was a mean, mean man. His name was Tarudaho. Tadadaho to join the new confederacy, Hiawatha and the peacemakers seek a powerful ally. A woman named Jagonsase. Jagonsase was the first clan mother. She helped bring peace to the Iroquois, to the Haudenosaunee. The peacemaker strikes a deal with her. She can stop the war. She can choose the chiefs. Jugansa say transforms Tadadaho's mind and he abandons war. With the final obstacle overcome, the peacemaker assembles representatives of each nation. Under a total eclipse of the sun, the peacemaker holds the newly woven Hiawatha belt, and with the nations gathered beneath the tree of peace, he speaks the law of peace for the first time. I'm going to go back a little bit here. So <clears throat> this wampum belt that we're actually talking about that we saw with the purple and um, white shells, those are the shells that um, the great peacekeeper on Hiawatha actually found from the kind of birds rising above. This is the basis and this actually story 
is very important to American history because these are the individuals that were brought in by Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin when they were writing the Constitution. They were trying to figure out how do we have a national government and state rights at the same time because the states didn't want to give up all their authority. So they actually invited the Haudenosaunee as their honored guests. And the Haudenosaunee, the way they did their democracy is actually how we framed our state's rights versus a national sovereign presidential rights um, in terms of an overall federalist system. So we actually borrowed it from the Haudenosaunee and they are the longest continuous democracy in the history of the planet coming now in about 900 years. We're currently at about 250. We have another culture then that develops. And so up here, remember, is that Eastern Woodlands Mounds. We have the Mississippian culture over here, which we have right within this prospect here. And so this is Cahokia. And Cahokia is, means actually City of the Sun. And it goes from 750 CE to about 1300 CE and was the largest um, um, city in all of North America until Philadelphia when the United States becomes a country in 1776. So here's an overview of what Cahokia would have looked like. This is right in the middle of the United States, the Mississippi. So as you said before, then the idea of teepees really comes from the Great Plains. And one of the things that we often confuse, the Great Plains are this large green area here, where we had thousands of the, actually millions of the buffaloes that actually show up. So during the colder part of the year, they lived in these individuals. Basically, many of them, like the Pawnee, lived in these things that are called earth lodges, which were mud, basically with posts that were covered up. And you would have a community living here that might be 50 people. When we went to buffalo hunting, that's the only time we lived in heat teepees out in this area. And so it was basically portable housing, kind of like a tent. This was not their permanent house. They had much more permanent houses because sometimes you have very harsh winters within this this time frame as well. If we go farther out, the Southwest United States, right over here, and even part of a little bit of the great, excuse me, basin that shows up here, these are the Southwest Native Americans. And they created basically these communities or pueblos um, in rock cliffs or in the desert landscape. Basically where Monument Valley, where most of our cowboy movies later on were shot because of the director, John Ford, loving this beautiful area. Um, but this was not a largely inhabited in, um, area, largely because there's not a lot of agriculture being grow in most part of that southwest United States. So here's one of the great national parks I would highly recommend you going to at some point. This is a cliff mound park called Mesa Verde, uh, the green mesa or the green table that shows up here. So here's what it looks this like. This is Cliff Palace, the largest alcove cliff dwelling It's an amazing place world. to go to. It's on the border of Utah Colorado's and Colorado. Mesa National Park. Altogether, there are more than 4,300 sites so far discovered within the 82 square mile national park. The perfection of these pre made permanent dwellings in a setting of an abundant wild food and fresh flowing water Look how they're hidden. must have had a sharp cosmic contrast with the ever present. They, have, they would have ladders to get there. Mason and then they could put up the ladders and not have to worry about going to work. These are harsh punishment for error. These are individuals that very much want to live on the one can intuit on the, the edge, humans have lived but not in fast fight. series of alcoves at Mesa Verde ever since they first laid eyes on them. The dwellings might have seen a flurry of family and festivities for generations at a time, followed by centuries of silence. They built giant structures on the plateaus of the mesas when the population was plentiful, but came back to the cliffs during hardships or hostility. On the flat landscape of the upper mesa, people laid out straight parallel roads and built square uniform buildings next to crops planted in neat even rows. But in the cliff dwellings, trails wind through valleys according to ancient contours and people live in shelters scattered along the cliffs by the earth you know, in a very hot climate this actually provides natural air conditioning and natural heat as the earth takes much longer to um cool because the alcoves are um, during the winter dry and sheltered space for thousands of people and are lined with the flat block-shaped building stones that had flaked off of the ceilings those first inhabitants were immediately afforded the luxury of free time so they domesticated turkeys, planted crops, made tools, and raised families. 
Mesa Verde saw its first human inhabitants just after the last ice age before 10,000 BCE. Increased sophistication was indicated by a basket maker period around 400 CE. With a spike in population and enhanced architectural capacity a couple hundred years later, the families in and around Mesa Verde became a thriving interdependent series of communities. The developmental Pueblo period prior to a thousand years ago has all of the elements you know, like every other civilization we see from the Greeks and the Romans, we can actually track the, of labor, the development a of a civilization here. of architecture and a vast system of agriculture. In the classic Pueblo period after a thousand years ago, the sophistication of the civilization would rival that of any found in Europe or Asia at the time in terms of the quality of right, life. Europe of and Asia are in the Dark Ages the going into the Romanesque and Gothic period now. This was a sentiment expressed by some Spanish conquistadors who had visited the Pueblo late in the 16th century, remarking that they felt like the degree of civility within the Pueblo culture was greater in fact than their own. A remark that they had never made about another group of people. We come off of the Mesa now, down into the dwellings at the step house. Partially reconstructed, we can see here a recreated subterranean dwelling using the original style of workmanship it shows the level of artistry that must have been demonstrated all throughout the dwellings. And we finish at the balcony house, an incredible system of dwellings built into a massive alcove, made to be incredibly defensible. Both a place to secure grain and other food storage throughout the year to keep them away from animals, and a place to be defended and secure against marauding invaders. So the stone dwellings were built and rebuilt over the centuries into communities along a strata of the cliffs in a mountain range that rises out of the desert like an island paradise. Even the strongest structures built in our modern vein are no match for the dwellings made by the world that will never see a drop of rain. So long after our era is ashes and our convoluted system crashes, the ancient sanctuaries made by the world remain. And so one of the great outdoor trips that you could potentially take is to go and see, particularly the Southwest United States. So you can go see Mesa Verde here, where you can actually walk around into the balcony house and see into the various um, houses and take tours into many of these different individuals. You can go horseback riding, basically the same way Native Americans used to go horseback riding, where we film our cowboy movies in Monument Valley, which is actually a Native American um, reservation. So you can actually go and spend time there. And this is what we were on the Johnny Depp tour. So Johnny Depp filmed a film here, and so we took the same trails looking at the beautiful rock formations. And my favorite national park in the United States these states right here is Bryce Canyon with these karst formations, these beautiful what are called kudus that show up um, that are weathered over time. And you have one of the most beautiful walks within here, named for the first settler Bryce who tried to bring cattle within this area. And then finally, we have the Northwest West Coast, which is completely a um, all the way up here, Northwest Coast, right on the coast itself going up into Alaska and Northern Canada, which is completely based upon a gift-giving culture. So no individual cultures are very different within the Native American tradition, but are still considered part of that Latin American condition um, of what we're going. When we move further south and into Mexico, where we'll be spending most of our time today, early on in, in for this class, we're actually gonna start off with the very earliest culture. That earliest culture is the Olmec. Some of you may have never heard of the Olmec because we don't have that information but information about them. Where I am today is Tehuatewagan. So if you look behind me, lovely Tehuatewagan, here's the spelling of Tehuatewagan, their beautiful city, the city of the God becoming. Then we get into the Maya, and later on in the next class, um, if we have time, we'll actually talk about the Aztec as well. 
So the ancient foundations then that show up. Now the Olmec, as we talked about, the Olmec heart gland is called Tres Zeppo. And it's basically a combination of marshland and hilly structure. So if you look where the Olmecs live, they live right in the middle. So this is Mexico, right here at the curve of Mexico coming up. Their dominant area is here. Olmec, actually, we don't know even what they call themselves. So Olmec is the name we gave them. Olmec means the people of rubber because they were the first people that actually used rubber to make balls and other things that they were actually using as kind of linings that were waterproof um, well before we were using rubber for such things in, in the Western world. And so they did have rubber that actually grew wild and naturally. Here is Tres Apolt, uh, which is really amazing kind of heartland if you look at it for what a population was able to do in the middle of what is largely a marshland and a jungle. Um, a lot of the early Native American populations, the Olmecs, later on the Aztecs or uh, the Mexica, are gonna have that same aspect where they're gonna be founding on a natural area that's marshland and they have to reclaim the land itself rather than finding different land, land which is pretty remarkable. Why? Because their ancestors told them, this is the chosen land for you. Moses has chosen land of the Jewish people was in the desert for 40 years, and we don't question that. Here they had actually worked to reclaim the land itself. Now what makes the Olmec amazing is this. They are the only culture in all of human history to emerge fully as a civilization without intermediate steps of bands, tribes, chiefs, and then states. It's as if there was nothing, and now we have a fully-fledged civilization that looks like this. We don't see the development we saw with the Pueblo, where we look, can look at basket and later basket period, and then Pueblo and then architecture. We don't see the Greek civilization or the Mesopotamian civilization, the early civilizations. They are the only civilization that appears fully emerged. We've looked all over for the remnants from an earlier culture. We've been looked all over the jungle. Maybe it's here, maybe it's not, but it would be very unusual. And the only culture that basically came fully formed from another individual. Their artwork looks like no other artwork in anywhere else in the world, which means that they probably did not come from anywhere else that was a fully developed civilization and just have a fully different aspect of their art. There's something that's very strange about this kind of civilization. And their most famous artworks then are these colossal heads. And they are colossal heads. They're four and a half, five feet tall. They weigh thousands of tons. And they're carved from the holy Tuxtla Mountains over here which are about 60 miles away. So the, the quarry shows that large scale figures roughed out before they were shipped. So you have a rough ship, so you almost can roll them because they don't have pack animals. And later on, after the death of whoever it is that they represent, whether it's a king or a ball player, they mutilated some of their own monuments, whether that's a sacrificial ritual, whether that's to make sure that the God King um, is no longer here and that we have a new God King, we do not know. But the Olmec then are considered the mother culture of all of Latin American cultures, of the Mayan, of the Aztec. And they really do live from 1600 to about zero BCE or zero CE, however, however you wanna phrase that transition that shows up. So this is the, basically the same time period as the Greeks, almost the entire history of the ancient Greeks, and, and about half of the period of the ancient Romans. So they do dominate the area. And here's what we actually get from them. The idea of the importance, let me drop this down here, so we can all see lovely chocolate. The importance of the jaguar and eagle to cosmology, we're gonna see this over and over in art. They are the two great animals that actually rule the world. Eagle known for eagle eye, having great eyesight so a king, a ruler, a chief can watch over all of his people flying overhead, almost a surveillance aspect. The jaguar can sneak up, and the jaguar is an amazing creature because it's one of the few creatures that actually can kill you and then just disappear into the forest almost like it's a god or like it's a king that can just take the life. Their mathematical system is gonna be based upon 20. So rather than 10 times 10 being 100 being single number, they're gonna have 20 times 20, which is much more complicated because 20 times 20 is 400, times 20 is 8,000, times 20 is 1.6 million, times 20 is 32 million. So we get very complicated numbers rather than 10, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. They're gonna do ritual bloodletting and human sacrifice. This is naturally part of um, their process. And the farther we get into these civilizations, the closer to the modern day period, all the way up into the Aztecs, it becomes a bloodbath. The, it's as if the gods need more and more blood. We're gonna have the importance of solar and lunar calendars. 
um, specifically of solar calendars for agriculture, development of the ball game, which is a ball they play with rubber, and we are not convinced whether it's the winners or the losers who die and are sacrificed as sacrifices to the gods. They're going to cultivate cocoa, corn, beans, and squash, the other three sisters of Native American agriculture. They're going to domesticate turkeys and dogs, and they're going to control the trade routes of subsidian, which is this material here. Now, before we have iron working technology, whoever controls the flow of obsidian is going to control Central America. So they fight wars over it. You see, obsidian is pretty rare. It's this area right here. And basically, obsidian, as you can see, is a special type of magma that comes out and cools very quickly in water. And so it's pretty rare. We only find it in a couple places in the entire world. You can find some obsidian on Hawaii, but it's rare even on Hawaii because the temperature is too high. We find a fair amount in Yellowstone, so it was shipped from Yellowstone to places like Cahokia, um, and then we find it in the Mexican area, right out of Mexico City. It is a sharp glass-like surface. It makes some of the best sharp edges and chisels, and it's got this beautiful coloration that varies. And so as you turn obsidian with the layers, because they cooled so fast, they settle in striations rather than settling to the bottom for the heavier metal and metallic content. So you get these beautiful striations. So as you turn a piece of obsidian, you may get greens and blues and purples and blacks and grays. It's this mysterious smoky haze and it's gorgeous, particularly for the most beautiful pieces. Their weapons were almost all made of obsidian. In fact, if you ever go to have brain surgery somewhere in the United States or around the world today, we still will most likely cut you open with obsidian. So we still use that as a dominant tool that we use today because of the sharpness like glass. They are going to consider themselves the people of the jaguar, as best we can tell. And they're going to have jaguar arts. If you look at the lovely colossal heads, you'll see they have the upturned lips, which we call jaguar lips, for their understanding of the wear, the wear jaguar. Kind of the idea of werewolf, only wear jaguar here with the upturned lips. The jaguar art honors an Olmec myth about the coupling of a jaguar with a human being. The jaguar is also fe feared, as I mentioned before, it's the only animal in Central America besides rattlesnakes that really can kill humans. Um, and Mayan later on, jaguar becomes Balam. And so you're going to see that word or hear that word in others. And it's the names of mythical heroes and some Maya, Maya rulers. Rather than calling themselves Efer or King, they might call themselves Balam Pakal, right? The Pakal jaguar. To see how amazing it is, here's a jaguar and how it blends in with the fallen leaves. They're almost impossible to spot. Go to the any zoo, and they've mostly been hunted to extinction. The eagle is the idea of the eagle eye. And if you killed enough individuals, depending upon the culture you lived in, or actually more likely captured them to bring them back for a ritual sacrifice to honor your gods so you don't have to sacrifice your own people, you could actually join either the eagle or the jaguar knights. And these are actually um, Aztec drawings, Aztec painting artworks from their codex, basically their version of books written on deer skin. Now, the individuals, as we looked at it, they were fascinated with the idea of death. And so warriors, whether you're in this particular case up here, whether you're a jaguar, you know, he's got the jaguar helmet, jaguar skull underneath him, whether you're a basic warrior that's actually learning the various traits to become up, move up, whether you wear a feather shield of the jaguar, which is made of beautiful feathers, what you would do is basically when you were not fighting, you would be A, training, and B, you would sit around writing poetry about death and about meeting your maker while you drink chocolate. And that was the life of someone who actually is a, an Aztec Mayan warrior. So here's one of the poems that we know that now exists on the nature of death. Feather of Quetzal will break, the paintings will fade, the flower will die. Will they exist in the house of the giver of life? Olmec art itself features unusual for this area, three-dimensional volume, geometric structure, correct harmonious props, flame eyebrows, as you can see kind of flaring out within different ones that are showing up here, and the wear jaguar lips. And from what we can tell, the Olmec images, remember, we don't even know what they call themselves because we haven't been able to translate their language. Their Olmec images generally we think show ruler and elite figures that very well might be these images here, note the sacrifice, hybrid human animal figures, which we see all throughout 
other cultures because they're trying to understand how they fit in with the world and, and also combine humans with animal powers. We see that in ancient Egypt with Anubis, which is a jackal-headed god. We see that with the men, minotaurs and centaurs from Greek and Roman culture. And we're going to see real animal, animals that get depicted. But mostly the idea of ruler elite figures here within the Olmec culture. One of the great finds was actually this, and I'll show you one more image of it in the next one. Nope, I'll have it go to Hood. We'll come back and look at that. So the Olmec colossal heads then, we believe they were glorifying rulers while they alive, and they commemorated them as ancestors after their death. You'll note these lovely images here are green stone spools. So they're small little green stones that basically were used to make a helmet. And these helmets might have been ball game headgear that their glorified ancestors and the glorified rulers were actually wearing. So they might have been an active participant in a game that has dedication and was dedicated to the gods. You'll note this person even has this one. Some of them have this on it. This is a jaguar paw. So you have a jaguar paw literally coming over the top of the green school as part of the necklace, probably because he's a jaguar warrior. We've also seen eagle claws or talons coming up in this. And you can see the upturn, some more marked than the other, of the jaguar lips that show up here. So this is, we have heads all over the, the this colossal heads all over. So there are different types of heads which we can classify, which we don't need to worry and go into detail here. But note, you can see the heads are actually different, um, both in style and shape. Some of them actually were marked up during their own day with these pock marks that show up. Some were left, and you can see later on the pock marks that those are jaguar spots that actually show up here uh, in the sporadic function. This is the one I mentioned before. We found a remarkable grave. This is a huge rattlesnake face that shows up here, basically the beginning of the Mayan god Quetzalcoatl, or rattlesnake or feathered rattlesnake. So the idea of the eagle and the rattlesnake, two wonderful kind of powerful creatures from this area. It's 50 tons of polished, ironically named serpentine stone. And it's 15 by 30 feet and it was buried. It's almost an homage to the individual that was buried within it. Note, right next to it, we had found 16 male figures, this in a semicircle in front of six jade cells or Stella. So we're talking about little tiny figures that show up here. And they were all laid out with cinnabar, which is this lovely red offering. The red offering might be the cinnabar, might be offerings to the dead. And so we have these buried jade cells formation. We're still trying to interpret them. We don't have enough information. So we really are still speculating on it. The city that I am in front of today right outside of Mexico City by about an hour, is considered the kind of the mother place after the Olmec culture. And it was considered a place of the idea of you know, divination, myth, the gods gathered here to plan creation and man. It's basically known as the place of God becoming. It was larger than Rome. Note the dates here. We've actually moved into the, in the Western world where we'd be in the middle of the Roman Empire. It was larger than Rome. There are 2,000 different platform buildings. We have 600 pyramids. 500 craft workshops, 200,000 people population. They control the route of obsidian. That's why they're able to actually make such a huge, powerful culture. And at the time, this was the sixth largest city in the world. So this was a city on the scale of Rome. I mean, Rome reached about a million, but this is 200,000. When we rebuild the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan, this is kind of the aspect of what we get versus what is left today. So it's pretty much intact, largely because it's made of stone in an area where as long as an earthquake doesn't destroy a large mound and this one can shift a little bit, you end up with some interesting things. Here's a reconstruction of Tewa Tewakan in that lovely image where you get a reconstruction of the city itself as you're flying around. And you can see it extends for miles for 200,000 people. You know, it's not much smaller than Miami today in the modern day world. The temples were all ritual centers where probably mostly sacrifices are and where you have temples. Um, and it was based upon this kind of construction. So this is called a talud tablero. So here's the spelling. Tablero is the flat piece up here. 
and Thalud is that area that sticks out. So it's a decorated way of doing a pyramid as it steps up. Here you can see a really good construction. On the outside of the tablero, then, you would put your gods. So here we have over and over repeated that green and red. We have a combination of the two or two of the most powerful gods in the ancient world. This one with the double eyes up here represents the rain god. The Mayans are going to call him Tlaloc. T-L-A-L-O-C, Tlaloc. So that's the rain god combined with the sun god over here um, from, the Mayan, or from the Mayan, who we're going to actually call Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent that goes across the sky. So here we have a feathered serpent, which is a feathered rattlesnake. And you can see the feathers coming back, running into Tlaloc. And then we have Tlaloc here, and you get a close-up of the feathered serpent. They just repeat one after another, basically on these particular temples. You'll note the bright red and green. In the inside of the temple, you get these beautiful images and paintings that still stand today. So this is the great goddess of Tewo Tewokan. We are still working out what the great goddess specifically means, but you'll note the large circular eyes here and here reference the fact that, you know, the importance of rain in a pretty dry climate, which is on the idea of kind of being savanna type environment where they do need rain in order to be able to grow their crops, crops and survive. If we go back and we look at it, we'll see there's vegetation growing out of this world tree here. So we see the lovely vegetation coming up. Um, and it may be the idea that the tree that we're looking at is hallucinogenic morning glory vines. So this might be a hallucinogen to let this individual talk about and see in the less visible world. In the non-Western world, there's the visible world where we all live and the less visible world where the gods and everyone gets to interact. If you look very closely, you'll see spiders that are crawling around in the morning, morning lower, glory. That's a reference to darkness, underworld, and the caves, right? The idea of the afterworld and death. The yellow skin coloration is actually very unusual in Latin American art. We generally don't see that. So that's an unusual feature. You're gonna know we're gonna have Quetzal bird. Here's a Quetzal bird with its beautiful green feathers, almost hunted to extinction by the Native Americans. Note the nose piece here is this rectangular bar with two circles, which hangs two fangs right here. And she transforms into spider of the underworld, which is taking place right here. And note the priestess or the priests here, they're actually letting out their own blood. So they're doing their own blood by pricking their fingers and allow blooding flow. So water flows from the body and from the hands. And note down here, people in the underworld are swimming in currents that are filled with spiders. So this is probably on the inside of a, a cave. So this is the great goddess from Tewatewakan, goddess of the underworld, darkness, earth, water, war, and possibly even creation. We don't know that much again because we're still working on translating all those texts. Luckily, we've been able to translate Mayan, um, Aztec, uh, Mexica, so we have a better semblance of what's going on there. They had these beautiful burial masks. These are all different burial masks. Some were constructed of individual pieces. Some are solid rock that were actually carved. Um, and this is largely using obsidian and other hard elements, serpentine, to make some really beautiful images used as death masks, the same way that kind of we mummify the bodies in Egypt to protect them. The largest pyramid we have in the New World, the Pyramid of the Sun. Um, the idea of pyramid, the, the word was wheats, and we think that word actually translates as mountain. So the larger the wheats or the larger the mountain, the larger the most important of the individuals. And it was a funerary monument and sacred temple made of earth and lava stone. You can see the scale of this. This is on the scale of the Great Pyramids. It's only about half as tall, but it's far wider within the process. So a much larger base, almost like a mountain would be. It was built over a natural cave. And the Mayans, the Aztecs later on, so we assume the Tehuatehuacanos believe that the opening to the underworld is through a cave that was dedicated to the water god because the importance of water here, Tlaloc, there's not a lot of rain. During construction, young soldiers, priests, women, and children were sacrificed in groups of 8, 18, and 20. And if you look at those numbers, you get basically somewhere around 360. 8, 18 times 20 is the Venus calendar of 18 months, of 20 days, and eight years to full circles, which basically equals five solar years. They're gonna be masters of Archeo astronomy. And Venus, the god that we considered, actually the goddess of love, was for them was a, was a male war god 
and the temple is oriented towards the rise of Venus each day. So it's 210 feet high, which is about half the height of the Great Pyramid, 720, about double the size and width of the Great Pyramids. Now, one of the things that we have to talk about, which makes people very uncomfortable about this culture, is the idea of blood run, bloodletting and sacrifice. Bloodletting, going all the way back to the ancient Roman traditions, is one of the oldest medicinal practices. It's actually even mentioned by Hippocrates from the ancient, you know, the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take when they become doctors. The bloodletting ceremony, commonly done from the fingers, the tongue, the ear, the shin, the elbow, and gentlemen, unfortunately, your junk in your penis. Here you can actually see the red is actually has a concoction of iron oxide mixed, but it also has a mixture of human blood that's actually used to paint these large scale murals. And this large scale mural is about six feet wide, uh, actually about eight feet wide, about six feet tall. And so here we have, note, a Quetzalcoatl figure. So here we have an individual with a jaguar head, right, jaguar head, with a feathered serpent, or that might be a rattlesnake jaw with a feathered serpent. We can't be for sure. Over here, we have a maguey, which is a type of cactus that was used to actually make tequila and the national drink of Mexico still today is pulque, which is basically a highly alcoholic drink that was made from this cactus. Note the sharp edge. So if you pull that out and you use the root aspect of that edge or the spikes, you can prick yourself and allow blood to flow as a sacrificial offering to the gods. So not only did they sacrifice other individuals, they're sacrificing their own blood. They would burn it and that would rise up to the heavens for the gods to have something to drink. We see this all over their art. So in Mayan art, here's Lady Jacques. This is shield jaguar right here and Lady Jacques, Mayan. And note, she has actually cut her tongue and now is pulling a rope through her tongue to collect the blood, as much blood as she possibly can. There are three main ways for you to let blood. You can cut yourself open and very quick with obsidian, right, a very sharp knife. You could use the spine of a maguey. You can see the spines and the sticks that are coming up. Or the most powerful, but also the best sacrifice, is a stingray spine. But unfortunately, a stingray spine has teeth that has little mini teeth. And so once you put a stingray spine in, if you yank it out, it yanks all the meat. So the best thing is to go all the way through. So you're not ripping through flesh, you're more cutting through flesh. And yes, people do die from this. So in the shield, lag, shield Jaguar and Lady Jacques over here, we see that ritual sacrifice. Note, in other people that are doing sacrifice, here we have a woman who's actually sacrificing her own blood. You see there's the cup holding the blood there. The clan founder emerges as a vision. So it's almost like if she's lost enough blood, she would start to have visions. And bloodletting can cause hallucinations and dreams of the less visible world. That was one of the goals, actually, to be in touch with the less visible world by letting your own blood. You know how you get lightheaded if you've ever donated blood before. Now, this was generally done from the maguey plant. And so we have a difference between tequila and pulque, which is still the national drink of Mexico. This is pulque. It's the natural kind of sugary alcohol that comes out. And oftentimes, the whether where you have a healthy um, plant from maguey depends on whether you have what we call the tequila worm. The idea of the worm inside of it, is it dead, is it alive, is it growing, um, to tell the health of a plant. And that's why we still oftentimes in real tequila, will put a tequila worm inside of it to show that it's, it's healthy, it's wonderful, it's actually real tequila. This is an individual or a group of people. And as I said, as we go farther along, it's going to get more and more violent in terms of human sacrifice. But human sacrifice was considered very important. It stalled the demise of the world. The Mayans, the Aztecs, the Teotonicos, they believe that the earth is in a series of cycles. Either four or five different worlds are going to end and that we are in the last cycle. The only way that we can end the last cycle is by having the gods forestall and not letting the last cycle of the planet take place. And you do that by offering them God, God food, and God offerings. And that was human blood. We'll talk about why that is in a moment. It was never used as a punishment. The sacrifices were burned and that way they would float up to the heavens with the gods. Um, the execution and sacrifice were not confused. So um, execution is for bad individuals. That's never the blood that the gods want. 
the gods generally, and each god has their favorite type of blood. Um, there is a, a, a god who actually likes sick male children. There is a god who likes the blood of virgins, female virgins. There's a god who eats the opacity of the sun who wants male strength and, and blood from a male warrior you've captured in war. And so um, the idea of this is going to lead us to what are called flower wars. And that's where you have your jaguar and your eagle knights go out and capture victims to bring back the sacrifice to your gods so you don't have to sacrifice them. The way that it works, and I'll show you a video of this in a minute, the priest showed the god to the victim and said, basically, this is your god, even if you didn't believe in this god. Six priests were need, needed to do ritual sacrifices. And I should mention, these are actual codices. So these are Aztec and Mayan drawings that the Spanish, they destroyed most of the drawings, show the ritual sacrifice. You would need one for each arm and leg, one for the throat, and one to keep the chest open. The priests collected the blood and smeared it on the god images and on their own bodies. They were covered and probably stank from the, you know, the death around. The priest held up the heart in the sky and then burned it. And the human kind sacrifice was payment humankind owed to deities for their initial blood sacrifice. And that is because, oh, that is because the um, Mayans, the Aztecs, the ancient um, population in this part of Mexico believed that the gods took their own blood. They mix it with the grease from their hands. They mix it with a little bit of dirt. And basically that became the, the raw material that we use to make humans. It's very similar to the way we make a tortilla, right? You take earth, corn, that comes from the earth. You take water, which is the grease from their hands. You take butter or some kind of aspect of something to soften it a little bit more and roll it together. That's the blood. That really is what happens. And that's why the, the myth or the idea that comes through when, at, when Cortez was coming in and they thought he was the god becoming Quetzalcoatl so they learned more about him, the returning of a god that had been left for so long, they sent him tortillas soaked in human blood. That's what they want to eat. That's their own body and so on. So the codexes that we're looking at, they're pre-Columbian books. They're done on deer skin. And they're almost all destroyed for being anti-pagan. So we only have a few of them left around the planet. And most, almost all of them are in Europe. Now, one of the most famous videos from this time period is a video called Apocalypto. But this video actually deals with all the things that are wrong with Apocalypto itself. Um, in class, we'll walk through the parts that are right about Apocalypto. But I specifically want to show you just one quick scene. As we look at, I want to look at the one scene. There are chilies, tortoise shells being sold. So this is people that are being left fabric. in. And I'm also happy to finally um, see some bloody for... Mayan women dressed appropriately by wearing a traditional pipio. As the war party approaches the city center, we see so some these are Mayan flower wars where with people their crazy outfits and crazy hair. Now, I tried to research into exactly how they would have looked, but the information is kind of scarce. Uh, the best idea we have is based on pottery, figurines, and murals to name a few. The so way these are people from village life that are being exactly collected way for human sacrifice by larger cities. Now, don't think of that as a unified group. They have scarifications, just like the real Maya, and they are wearing jade jewelry. Although, I do have to admit that there does seem to be an overabundance of it, simply because jade was usually reserved for the royal families, but let's be honest here, this inaccuracy is really tame compared to the ones we've already covered. As the captives are close to their final destination, the women are sold into slavery and the men are painted in blue dye to be prepared for human sacrifice. And so, here we are, the most controversial part of the entire movie, where the captives are taken to the top of a massive pyramid and they can see people, one after another, being sacrificed faster than a factory conveyor belt. There are so many historical inaccuracies presented here that they hurt my brain. So let's begin. By this point, the film is clearly Here's established the the classic Maya period, from the architecture to the massive pyramids and the dense population the city has. No kingdom after the Maya collapse would ever grow to this size again, or build pyramids such as these. And the failing crops and the famine are all clues that Apocalypto is showing the Maya collapse that took place around the year 900. So what I want to know is, why is the priest sacrificing his victims by extracting the heart? Mayans wouldn't do this until the post-classic period. 
And the reason why is because they were influenced by the Aztecs, who didn't even exist as a culture yet. Instead, Mayans at this time would perform sacrifices in a number of different ways. Uh, there would be bloodletting, for example, which was more of a self-inflicted, non-lethal sacrifice, where you'd pierce your tongue and pull a rope through it, or a man would pierce his foreskin and drip the blood on some paper they would burn. As for human sacrifices, the most common way it was done in the classic period would be through decapitation, they would fire arrows at their victims, or they would throw people down pits or sinkholes called cenotes. But another thing that's terribly wrong with this scene is that way too many people are being sacrificed, from the bodies piling up at the bottom of the pyramids to the mass grave we see later in the film. We can see that hundreds of people have been sacrificed. And obviously the reason why is because their crops are failing and they wish to appease the gods. Now in real life there was a sharp spike in human sacrifice at this time, uh, probably because of the drought they suffered, and as a desperate last resort, they even went as far as to sacrifice their own children. However, saying all of that, there is no archaeological evidence that the Maya ever carried out their sacrifices on such a large scale. Mel Gibson is obviously copying all of this from the Aztecs who actually did. Uh, archaeologists believe that they sacrificed up to 20,000 people a year on average. Uh, some years they sacrificed even more than that. So what's stupid about this movie is that it can't make up its mind about which civilization it wants to be based on. Is it about the Maya or is it about the Aztec? You can't use traits from both. Anyway, I want to wrap up this review before I burst a blood vessel. And so that is one of the interesting things in terms of kind of cultural confrontation, what you do is that is it Mayan or is it Aztec? If it's Aztec, we actually have a fair number of images, how of a fair number of accuracies in terms of the concepts and, and the overall arching of kind of how the sacrificial took place. Um, and if it's a Mayan, then the costumes and the jewelry and everything along those lines take place. But the film does go back and forth, but just give you an overview of the bloodletting that shows up. That's why I like showing the pieces of that clip. Um, the other thing that shows up within this is the Jaguar and the Eagle sacrificial blood they basically had heart receptacles. So you would take out the heart and take out the blood and you would actually put them I know, in a jaguar or an eagle that we keep seeing over and over. And that's what you would actually use to burn um, the blood so that would go up to the gods. And here is one of those scrapers you know, with an eagle. So you would actually dag this in. It would either be, um, and this is white obsidian that you would actually cut people open with. This is all gonna lead us then into the Mayans the idea of ritual sacrifice. But the Mayans then grow up in an area that basically doesn't have any above ground rivers. Note there's no rivers, there's no water. So that's why the the um, the uh, film actually meant the idea of cenotes. Cenotes are these large underground pits because they have underground water. So where the Mayan civilizations develop generally are around cenotes, these underground waters that have opened up so you have access to water for both um, drinking, bathing, ritual purposes, but also for irrigation because it's closer to the surface. Now the Mayan are specifically known for being the great classical artists because their art is much more beautiful, curvilinear, like we have in the Western world. So we often celebrate the Mayan as not being as violent and, and um, as morose as some of the other Latin American or and native cultures with, with cannibalism and with, um, the amount of death that we see from the Aztecs. And it's really because based upon a racial assumption, maybe not racist, but racial assumption, that their artwork looks more like us, so they must be more behaved, kind of like us. It's just not accurate. That's the basis of it. So Pakal the Great, one of the great Mayan lords. This is Pakal itself, in a video that deals then the Maya. with what the Maya looks like. considered one of the most advanced civilizations to have existed in the Americas before the Spanish conquest. But who exactly were the ancient Maya people and what led to the collapse of their civilization? As early as 1800 BC, the Maya had begun settling and established villages in what is today Mexico and Central America. Maya civilization peaked from 250 to 900 AD during what archaeologists call the Classic Period. More than 40 cities flourished throughout the region with populations as large as 50,000. 
the Maya built magnificent urban centers consisting of stone structures, including pyramid temples that were central to Maya religious practices. In addition to these impressive city structures, agriculture played a key role in Maya civilization. Corn was one of the predominant crops. The Maya creation story tells of nature gods, the basis of Maya religion, who created humans out of yellow and white corn. Hence the basis the of Tortilla. The Maya also made significant advancements in mathematics and astronomy. Mm. They invented the concept of zero, and they developed an accurate calendar system. Used to guide the Maya agricultural cycles, the calendar was based on observations of the sun and sky over thousands of years. The Maya also developed the only known system of writing in Mesoamerica, hieroglyphs. In fact, much of what we know about ancient Maya civilization comes from deciphering hieroglyphic characters inscribed in pottery, stone slabs, and other ruins discovered at ancient sites. Hieroglyphs have revealed that, despite the Maya's ingenuity and agrarian lifestyle, conflict was prevalent among some Maya city-states as they battled for control of the region. So don't think about them as a unified the the group. Period, they were actually individual cities that fought one another. modern-day Guatemala reigned as the closest thing to an empire in Maya history. But for a period of roughly 130 years, the Tikal people were overtaken through force and diplomacy by the Kanul, a rival kingdom. Toward the end of the Classic period, around 900 AD, most Maya cities had collapsed. Among the theories are warfare, a volcanic eruption, and, perhaps most likely, drought. However, archaeologists still debate why, as new evidence continues to emerge. Despite the decline of ancient Maya civilization, the Maya people have by no means disappeared. More than 7 million Maya are estimated to be alive today in their indigenous homelands and around the world. While they participate in modern global life, they continue to follow agricultural and ceremonial practices of their ancestors. <coughs> and actually, here's a quick video on Mayan glyphs and how we what read looks at first glance, like ancient on this deer skin. Most language. of these have actually been destroyed but What now. does this homegrown Mesoamerican script teach us about the history of writing? A Maya stoneworker etches elaborate rows of characters onto a stela, a tall stone brought in from far away that's now standing straight up in the middle of the city. The characters he's carving look more like detailed pictures than writing, but don't let that fool you. Take a look at this block. It means mountain, but it's not a logograph standing for mountain. It's not a Reba symbol for think of a word that rhymes with schmountain. It's actually a block of two sound symbols that spell the word wheat the Maya word for mountain. That's great for climbers, but chocolate lovers may instead prefer to sample these three symbols that together spell the word cacao, cocoa. There's a nifty shortcut here. This bit doesn't even mean ka. It's actually a syllable multiplier or iteration mark if you want the fancy name. Shh, I think you're being watched. Over there, in the jungle? Maybe not. Hmm. Major moments in the history of writing. Both of these Maya glyphs combine syllable characters into blocks to write words. This is full-fledged sound writing. These aren't logographs that happen to be read as sounds. They are sounds. Sounds capable of writing any syllable in the language. In a full syllabary, like the classical Maya script, there are separate characters for just about every possible syllable in the language. No longer must you invent new word characters. You can make do with a much smaller set of syllable characters. Nice, but syllable writing comes with its own set of problems. Here's a glyph that's quite useful around these parts, jaguar. The word is actually balam. But have you noticed something about the Mayan syllabary? Consonant plus vowel, consonant plus vowel. 
more consonants plus more vowels. All of these syllables end in vowels. How in the world are you supposed to write the long in belong? Shifty, scripty syllabaries have grappled with this problem and settled on two solutions. One, leave out the final letter. Just ignore it. The term for this is underspelling because you're not fully spelling the word. And it's a good solution because, you know, ignoring your problems makes them go away. Option two, spell the last letter with an extra syllable, but use a syllable that just repeats the last vowel so that we know we can just ignore the final vowel. This gets called the echo vowel. Mayan likes number two a lot. So cacao is kakawa. Well, ka times two wa. Weets, the mountain, is actually weetsi. And your new pet balam is spelled balama. Cross out the echo vowels and the words practically read themselves. Your new friend pulls you along to show you another project he's working on, an amate codex. That's a paper book. Yes, he has paper and yes, books. But that's not what's got him excited. He folds open the book he's working on, maybe to share a new idea? No. To brag about how inventive and potentially efficient his writing system is? No. For his people, the invention of the new wasn't about ditching the old. He shows you how creative he's been with the characters you learn. He shows you a mountain and calls it Queets, and then a jaguar and calls it Balam. Logographs? Wait a second. You stop and ask him, which is the correct way to write Balam? He writes Balama. You ask him to write it again, and he writes the logograph, but with a syllable. And again, but he writes the logograph plus two syllables. He smiles mischievously. They're all Balam. This is what he's proud of. He can write the same word, even the same syllable, in different ways and combinations without repeating himself. Creative. But his use of logographs plus syllables recalls the tension between sound writing and meaning writing. Meaningful determinatives helped us choose the right pronunciation for our Rebus character, and Mayan logographs can still do that. But the helping hand goes both ways. The syllabary can also clarify the sounds you should make when you read a logograph. Here's the character Jaguar. But add a couple extra syllable hints and you make it clear that we're meant to read this glyph as balama, minus the echo vowel, so balam. These are phonetic complements, pronunciation clues sitting comfortably alongside logographs. And so the Mayan actually has a quite complicated language because it's a language that has both pictures, both picture graphics. It also has sound and the combination. And so it allows individuals to make very complex poetry. So when we look at Aztec and Mayan warriors, one of the things they're doing is writing poetry when they're not training for war and drinking chocolate within the process. They are being creative within their own fields and are meant as artists. So when we look at the Mayan and kind of what they wear and their, their impact, they wear long green quetzal feathers, plumes were most highly prized and also contain mask of rain god chalk or the sun god. So they have these beautiful plumes that are stick bundles of the scribe in their headdress indicating they're literate. That's these stick bundles that are right here. You see that each individual stick often covered with clay or some other material. And that would be something that you could wear in your hair for about a month. And Mayan kings wore racks on their backs to support large headdresses, which basically allow you to shoot off these beautiful feather headdress that may rise three to four feet above your head is great green quetzal feathers. And so lacking metal tools, pulleys, and perhaps even the wheel, Mayan architecture required one thing in abundance, other Mayans, the manpower. And so look at what they're able to do in the middle of a jungle. It is spectacular kind of achievement. And these cities then would be for 20 or 30,000 people and would dominate the area. The best known Mayan leader of all time is an individual named Pakal. Here is his death mask. This is the top of his sarcophagus cover when we went into the temple of Pakal. And so if we flip it, you can see and color it in, the tree of life is coming from Pakal's stomach, showing the connection to the afterworld, unto the underworld. He is depicted here in the center as the Mayan hero twin, Hunapu, who goes out and plays the ball game for all of eternity. Note we have Tlaloc, the water god, those large eyes with the fangs coming from beneath, and the dragon with the open mouth all the way down here at the bottom. See the dragon with the open mouth. That is the idea it's showing the cave entrance to Jabalba. He's about to go and play in the Mayan underworld for all of eternity. 
And so we get these beautiful understandings of what afterlife actually revolves around the Mayan world. The Mayan underworld is called Jabalba, and no, it has nine levels, kind of like Dante's nine levels of hell, right? There's got to be different era variations. And note, there's some very dark areas that you have to get through in order to be able to go and play the ball game, be able to. So these they're ruled by a different god. So in this one, the Mayan world by one and seven death. The Aztec is, is a terrible pronunciation, but I apologize. Mictatatupuhtili. Um, and so you have nine levels that actually come from that. So sheer rock cliff to a raging river, you know, the river torrent, the river of blood without drinking it, stream of pus, the six houses of a bulba, the house of darkness, the house of cold, the house of jaguar, the house of screeching bats, the house of razors, the house of heat. Note each one is kind of like Dante's seven levels of hell. And then there's purgatory and other. So Shababa actually translates as place of fear in the Mayan and Aztec underworld because you don't know where you're going to end up. You have to fight your way through the underworld. We won't go through the Mayan creation myth today. So how are humans like tortillas? And the yellow and white corn were ground together. Um, Jumukane, the grinding nine times. Corn was used alongside with the water she rinsed her hands with for the creating grease which became humans. And so the creation of tortilla actually recalls in some level the Mayan creation myth. Beautiful Mayan frescoes that we talked about that still exist today. And so this is Temple of the Murals. This is on Bonampak in Chiapas um, in Mexico. And Chichen Itza, probably the most um, important scene. We saw this earlier in the semester when we were talking about the seven wonders of the world. Um, this is one of the modern seven wonders of the world that we just recently voted on. And it basically is a combination of Toltec and so in 987 CE, a Toltec king came to a Mayan area saying that it was Lord Quetzalcoatl arriving again with an army from the Toltec capital of Tula. And so Chichen Itza is a kind of a combination site where we have Toltec and Mayan influences at the same time. The word Chichen Itza itself actually means at the mouth of the wells of Itza, which are the cenotes where they get their water that allows them to survive. And it's probably most famous for the astronomical calibrations that show up. Oop, let me go back one. So their great temple, El Castillo, and their major platform, they have four sides of 91 steps plus one step at the top of the temple, which gives you 365 days a year. And at the equinox, this rattlesnake grows out towards a skull rack. And so it's like the rattle, Quetzalcoatl, is coming out to eat. So thousands of people actually show up here. They have the most and if we reconstruct it, here's what we believe the image would have looked like with numerous of those rattlesnake quetzalcoatl heads that are going up and down in that talud tablero kind of decoration that we saw earlier from Table Tehuacan. Here is the Plaza Caracol, which is basically considered a, a circular snail observatory. And the Mayans knew Venus's movements, so it takes 584 days to complete the cycle and five Venus cycles exactly equals eight years. So the Mayans were master astronomers. Of the 29 astronomical events that, that the Mayans tracked, eclipses, equinoxes, solstice, et cetera, there are sight lines for 20 of them where the light shines in at a particular time of day that are marked on the walls. So you really could tell what day it is. And the other nine measurements were likely from a partially lost tower up here. That's just um, from damage from a thousand years ago. They also have the largest ceremonial ball court in all of Mesoamerica. And this is the size of kind of the of a of a football field. And in the bottom of the ceremonial field, right here, underneath this, and again over here, are images that look like this that show the beheading of a ball player after, and the Mayans show the flow of blood as snake blood coming out within the process. Here you can see he's holding the head and then see the scraper, because he basically has just decapitated the individual. And so we don't know if it was the winners or the losers that actually get decapitated. Most contemporary thinking is that it's actually the winners, because that's the better sacrifice to the gods. So here is the Mayan foundation. For the Maya, understanding called the, the sky Kofuzu. was not the only otherworldly domain. And the gods of the sky were not the only ones that had to be appeased. Beneath the earth, there lay another vast realm, a supernatural underworld with 
the spirits of the dead roamed. For the Mayas, the structure of the world. We are living in the living plane, that is the earth, and then there's the skies with different levels, and of course the underworld. The underworld was the place where the people that are not living anymore are there. So for them, when you die, is not the end of everything. In the Popol Vuh, an ancient Mayan narrative, the underworld is called Shibalba, the place of fear. It has nine perilous levels, ruled by 12 lords, gods of death, who are responsible for disease and affliction. The Maya believe this place of death exists side by side with the land of the living. The underworld could be reached in the most unlikely of places. This huge open court in Chichen Itza looks almost like a marketplace, but no buying or selling went on here. It was the setting for an ancient Mayan ball game, a game far deadlier than any modern sport. Measuring 550 by 230 feet, the court is over twice the size of a modern American football field. Here, two teams faced off, with players aiming to hit the ball through hoops high on the walls. They play for the highest possible stakes, because the losing team faces being sacrificed to the gods. The winners kill the losers and cut off their heads. Wall reliefs show the victors holding a loser's severed head. At first glance, the high walls that surround the ball court don't seem to have much purpose. The reason for their existence could lie in the game's religious meaning. An ancient myth from the Popol Vuh explains its origins. In this story, heroic twins play the game with the lords of the underworld. The lords dismember them and burn their remains. The twins are reborn. Emerging from the underworld, they become the sun and the moon. They die and they revive again every day to remind humans that they got to keep in balance, um, maybe by making offerings and rituals specifically to the underworld. And so that ball game, um, in class, if we have time, we'll actually be playing a piece of the ball game where we actually try to keep the ball going um, in different Mayan contexts. Now the problem, of course, is there are multiple different ways to play that ball game. Um, and of course, you're gonna count and play to 20 because that is the dominant number that comes out of the, the Aztec. So the rules are generally there's no hands or feet. The ball can only bounce um, one time per side. The ball must be playable when it crosses the midterm, so it can't be rolling. A ball in the ring, so if you are really far behind, it's an automatic win, and 20 points to win. And so this all recalls the thing going back to Jabalba and the idea of these underground caves that develop from the underworld and the overworld. So the Yucatan have no above ground rivers. They have three natural sinkholes, cenotes, that provide water. And there is a cenote of sacrifice that actually took place where you could actually send individuals down towards the sacred rain god um, towards Shavalva. And all of this then leads us to the idea in the modern day world that we have of the ancient Mayan and the Aztecs in the idea of the Day of the Dead, a celebration of the ancestral world that we see. And as we talked about before, really comes out of the ancient Egyptian um, idea of ancestral worship. Now, as far as we know, these individuals did not have contact with the ancient Egyptians. So their understanding of death and the ancestors must have completely emerged and it's completely idea. So it was evolution, we would call this on, on some level, convergent evolution, where we have two different aspects showing up in the same kind of capacity. But um, it's two different cultural ideas that come to the same solution across the world to understand their ancestors. And that's what we're looking at. So that is kind of a brief introduction and today it plays out, and of course, some of the Disney movie Coco. Even upon death, this does come out of the pre-Columbian tradition that shows up 
what we talked about with the idea of sacrifice, the idea of the importance of death and the afterworld and what death actually means. Um, so this will play later on. I oh, hope everything is well and have a wonderful day. Bye.